I'm Bud Hinshaw. I'm from Oklahoma. I was on Anarui Talk and Bikini. And my tour of duty over there, you might say, was like a Sunday school picnic. Didn't do much. Come closer to the mic. I'm, if I get any closer, I'll be eating the thing. <laughs> but after my tour of duty, I found out I had a cousin that also participated in the atomic experiments early in his life. He was a bus driver. He had some stories. I spent four years and nine months in the service. I spent 346 days, nine and a half hours on Anawitok. I spent 90 days TDY to Bikini. That was a really good tour of duty. We had a bunch of Marines there. My job was keeping the our Air Force going, which consisted of two L-20 Beaver aircraft, single engine. Their mission was to ferry the civilian scientists to different islands around, or who knows what, probably to get radiation samples. They had on their nice white formal outfits. Their pant legs were taped shut. They had covers over their face and everything. They had their little suitcases. They would run out, jump on our aircraft. Oh, forgot. <laughs> They would get on our aircraft, way they'd go. They'd land on a couple of these other islands around, and then they would come back. We would meet them there. They would jump off with their little suitcase and run somewhere, and we were standing there in our official uniforms, which was cut off khaki shirts, military style, our Dress pants pants. or whatever were, I have to demonstrate this one, were cut off about here. But some of us, that wasn't quite good enough. <laughs> we would get them cut off about here. <laughs> we would take the pockets and we would sew them up. <laughs> They wouldn't hang down. <laughs> My shoes were issued World War II combat uh, no, programs, but they were about this much too long. The mic. Come back to the mic. Oh. I'm used to talking with the Toastmasters, and I get to roam all, all over the world, all over the room, rather. So that was my, you know, oh, I forgot my ball cap. When I, my first day on NOE talk, I stepped off of the plane and I was taken directly to the beach. They were getting ready to have a, a blast in a couple hours. And for some reason, I don't know how it happened, I was given some dark glasses. Here, I was a real rookie. I hadn't even been there. Other guys had been there for a year or almost a year, but forever, so they thought. And they had not witnessed a live shot with glasses. I did. I looked at the sun. Oh, I put them on first, of course. <laughs> then I looked at the sun, and all I saw was a pinpoint. A little dinky pinpoint. Then, after the countdown, 9, 10, 5, whatever they did back then, everything turned loose. The world lit up like voila. Then all the, the shock waves, all the fireball, all the, everything happened. And this all happened to an 18-year-old kid. I got to Anna talk because a friend of mine that I went through basic with 
was in trouble with the judge in Wright Patterson Air Force Base <laughs> in Dayton, Ohio. He said, Bud, come with me. And I said, oh, why not? I, I joined this, so I'm going to do like the Navy. I'm going to see the world. I'm going to go to the South Pacific. They didn't tell us what was in the South Pacific. <laughs> So consequently, we got down there, and here again, we didn't have to do very much. We had, must have been about 10,000 civilian construction workers on the other island, of, I believe it was Japtan. Is that right? No, Anawetok. I was on Anawetok. Japtan well, was a civilian, holds no, it was in. Fred and Perry. Fred and Perry. Perry, there you go. It's been so long since I was there. Yeah, Japtan was where we went for our squadron parties and our... Yeah. Yeah, okay. Uh-huh. <laughs> that... Well, now I lost my chain of thought, but uh, let's see. Duty, TDY, grid club. Uh -huh. well, I made a few little notes here, and I couldn't find until she brought them over to me. And I, they were in my folder anyway. So, on Saturday nights, we were allowed to go to the other island, the civilian island. We got on what was known as the African Queen. Yep. And we went over. We had to have a pass to get over there, but we went anyway. And they had the best steaks you ever got a hold of. All you could eat, everything. Then we came back on the African Queen and went to Duffy's Tavern. Yeah. And there we had a variety of different drinks. I was introduced to San Miguel beer, which uh, supposedly had different alcohol ratings. My favorite drink was a can of beer and a big glass of cognac. I thought that was real popular, and then all of a sudden I found out I didn't like cognac. <laughs> I did have uh, a rest and relaxation tour to Hawaii. Ah, this was something. I'd been isolated about nine months, which that's a whole new experience right there. And when I went through customs, I declared one-fifth of Canadian club booze. My buddy was with me. We went to the transit breaks, and canned Coke had just come out. So I dumped three-fourths of the Coke. I must have been about like that. <laughs> Filled it all up with uh, the good stuff. And that's when I had my first, um, well, let's say I vomited very well. <laughs> I lost everything. Woke up in the morning. I remembered something, but I can hardly take booze again like that. <laughs> then my next trip was a three-day pass to Guam. And I had saved some money so I could buy some clothes or whatever to come home on. But I'd spent my $70 that I'd saved in um, taking my buddy to Hawaii because he didn't save anything. We got to Guam, got on this people carrier, I'll call it. That's what was on there. It was just a big old truck. Four bys, call them four bys. I forgot my military terminologies. And we sat on the back of that thing, and we had a native driver, and he knew one speed. And we were sitting there on the side, and that thing, he's uh, uh, unexperienced people. We slid around, and the native that were riding on the truck, they sat there glued perfect. You know, <laughs> they, it was terrible. And oh, 
Well, another thing that was terrible, if you're ever on Guam, maybe it's changed now, don't order a pizza. <laughs> we had been starved to death for anything like that on Anawee Talk. First thing we did, we ordered this nice big pizza, and it came out like, um, well, it had some ketchup on it, and it had been around a fire somewhere. <laughs> it, it was terrible. But my, my biggest, really, remembrance, well, I shouldn't say that. I really always remember this. But when I came back, like I said, this had been a real Sunday school picnic. Nothing like anybody else here had talked about. Nothing. Well, we had a couple little incidents with the, uh, with the Army wanting to play taps and reveille and everything else. So we took care of that. We didn't have anything else going on at the time. <laughs> Being aircraft mechanics, we were issued dikes, wire cutters. Consequently, uh, we had a staff sergeant that uh, managed to shinny up the pole, cut the, cut the cable. Well, that took care of that for a couple of days. Then the Army came back. They spliced it back together. Well, it was destroyed again. They fixed it again. We decided, well, this has got to cease. This is no good. This time, well, I might say that uh, all this happened after a trip to Duffy's, Duffy's Tavern. <laughs> it was well thought out. The next time it happened, we got even with it. It lasted for about two weeks, something like that. The man with the dikes cut the wire from the Air Force section, the wire stretched across the mess hall, way up by the officer section in the Army area. He cut that wire up in chunks. <laughs> <laughs> but the Army got back with us. That's when they strung a big old heavy cable, wrapped it on, <laughs> and then they turned the volume up. I mean, they turned it up. It wasn't just a de -de -de -de. And that's when our first shirt went to the Army and said, either turn it down or else. Well, they turned it down. That was an early warning system for the, well, we didn't need to be warned to get out of bed and when to go to bed or anything like that. But like I started to say, my worst or best success, my experience was when I came home. After being in isolation for that 346 days, nine and a half hours, I didn't realize it at the time. We had our buddies all together. All of a sudden, I was home. I was by myself. I was in society. I was scared to death. I was afraid to talk to anybody. I couldn't look at a woman or a girl or my girlfriend or anything like that. I think I still had a girlfriend after all that, but it was, who knows. I had about 45 days leave time coming. I'd just been promoted from an airman third class about two weeks before I left Anna Weetok to an airman second class, still with a five level, and sent to Pope Air Force Base in North Carolina. I took maybe a whole week getting cross country. I was so afraid, so scared. I lived in the barracks to go to work, to come back to the mess hall. That was my routine. I did have a vehicle to drive around. It took me at least six months to start to come back into society. I did this through the service club. I went down there and I started to make a billfold. I'm gonna hand tulip. As far as I know, that 
that billfold is still at the service club. And with that, I want to say thank you for listening to my Sunday school trip. It wasn't anything like what you had. My goodness. We did have one staff sergeant at the squadron party swing up into the rafters, hooting and hollering, and then he got down, and then he stomped through the baked beans afterwards. So thank you again, and I appreciate all of this. You're welcome. You. While you were at uh, Bikini Atoll, uh, I spent quite a bit of time up there. You didn't happen to buy a chance an evening, you know, you lived in tents. You didn't happen to have the vegetarian rats come down there and visit you at night, did you? Uh, no, but one thing we did do, when we were shutting down the island. Okay. We, well, the Marines left all their booze around. Yeah. So we had to help them. Okay. Take care of that. Yeah, take care of that. We walked to work by way of the mess hall with a drink in our hand and we ate steak every day. I have to admit, you know, at Holmes and Arbor was the feeding organization, or the construction company out there, and they fed well. They really did. They really did. You talk about the rats on the island? No, on Bikini Atoll. We, yeah. could, we didn't have anything but tents to sleep in. We had rats on the ship, and they had to, uh, they give a gift certificate. You could step, you could stand and get stuff from Hong Kong and Japan. <laughs> Gift certificate called the Pied Piper or the Boxer, the guy that killed the most rats. So when we was on the island there, a couple of us got the idea that we would get the prize because there's so damn many rats on the island that, of course, we were pretty well tanked up. Yeah. We went out and clubbed a whole bunch of these damn rats and kind of smuggled them on board. <laughs> Well, the reason I ask you about the rats is because, uh, you know, I spent some time up at Bikini Atoll. They're vegetarian rats. They don't eat it. They won't eat meat at all. And, uh, but this amazing part of it is they come down off the ships on the big tie down to the port and they come down on the, on the island. Well, I got to tell you, the first night I was up at Bikini Atoll, uh, I'm sleeping on my back, and all of a sudden, about 2 a.m. in the morning, here's these two little beady eyes looking at me. 